All right, take your Bibles and go to Leviticus chapter 12. We'll unpack this a little bit. Leviticus chapter 12. These are some very, very odd texts. Leviticus chapter 12 deals with a woman who has just given birth to a child, whether that be a male child or a female, doesn't matter. We deal with both. And then chapter 13 deals with what in Greek is called leprosy, although modern day leprosy is a different category. So we're going to talk about these two things. And when we're talking about Leviticus, we're thinking in terms of relationship, one's relationship to the temple, to the tabernacle, and then later on to the temple. So everything is thought of in Leviticus in relationship to the tabernacle. How the priests relate to the tabernacle, how the sacrifices relate to the tabernacle, and then how the people relate to the tabernacle. For this is the place where the glory of God resides. He sits enthroned above the cherubim. He sits enthroned there, and so his presence is there. So you can't just approach him in any fashion that you desire. You have to approach him by on his terms. So... Leviticus chapter 12 says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days, as in the days of her customary impurity she shall be clean. So he's saying, look, every month, monthly cycle, women are unclean. That only means this, that they can't go to the tabernacle. We're talking again in relationship to the tabernacle. Okay, so everybody gets kind of wigged out over this stuff and says, well, why is God concerned with all this? Why does it really matter? Well, it's all this cleanness and uncleanness. What is that? And let's take the concept of uncleanness and cleanness out of the moral or immoral category because that's not what we're talking about. And we're not talking about cleanness or uncleanness with relationship to dirt, something you can wash away like you wash your hands if you get a little dirt on them. That's not the point. The point is that when you go into the tabernacle, you cannot have blood flowing from you, life fluid flowing from you, or diminished life fluid. Okay? So if you have a diminished capacity of fluid, life fluid, and the primary one is blood, the primary one is blood, then you are less life because blood has gone out of you, and the life of the flesh is in the blood, until your blood levels have come back to their normal levels, you can't go back into the presence of God. But now, since blood has left and come back, you have to do some things in the meantime. Like you have to offer some sacrifices or do some immersions. This is where we get ritual immersion. Okay? So we're talking about uncleanness as it regards going into the presence of God. That's the key to understanding this. Now, verse 4 says, Then she shall continue in the blood of her purification 33 days. Now look at this. She shall not touch any hallowed thing nor come into the sanctuary. That's the point. Until the days of her purification are fulfilled. If you've had a child, there's been blood. So now, so verse 5, But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her customary impurity, and she shall continue in the blood of her purification 66 days. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering. And I want to change a, some terminology here. And a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a, and they trans, some of your translations say, sin offering. Purification, not sin. She has not committed a sin. If she doesn't bring the sacrifices, then she's sinned. If she doesn't bring them in the time that she's supposed to, then there has been a sin. For failure to be obedient to what she's supposed to do. But being pregnant and having a child, whether male or female doesn't mean one's committed a sin. It means you need purification. 
with regards to entering back into the tabernacle. So they translate it sin offering, but it's a katat offering, which can be a sin offering depending on the category. Here it's a purification offering. So he says, verse 7, Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her, and she shall be clean for the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who has born a male or a female. And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, which Mary brings, by the way. Luke 2.24, Mary brings two pigeons. Lower end of the economic strata. The other, so one for a burnt offering, an ola, a whole burnt offering, and then one for a katat, a purification offering. Okay? And all of this relates to her going back into the tabernacle. Okay? So that's the purpose of this, is to say, when a woman has a child, she has a male child or a female child, doesn't matter whether it's male or female, she's unclean. She's sloughed off blood. Yes. Okay. I knew that was coming. I guarantee I knew that was coming. Well, I could give you the uh, I could give you a lot of answers to this question. Well, one is that God does not like women as much. <laughs> so, being the misogynist that he is, he twice as much. He's like, nah, just keep him down longer. <laughs> Got him under the thumb. Like, just keep pressing down. Okay, that's not, not really true. Now, um, although there are people, there are, um, there are um, uh, feminists who think that that's the case. That they think that this is because God hates women, you know, and, and so this is just another way of, this is the patriarchal way of God kind of, you know, putting women down. I, I don't think that's the case. Here's my, here's my understanding of it. Is that... There are times where in the process of giving birth that the female child will bleed as well. And so if the female child bleeds, they basically have the mother serving time for the, for the bleeding of the child. So, um, so she's doing double the mother, since the child can't do the duty, so to speak, the adult has to do it, so the mother has to do the double duty for the daughter. That's, now the male child will bleed on the eighth day and then healed, and then he can, he's okay. So he's gonna be, there's going to be bloodletting there. But you know, there's no circumcision for the female, obviously. So if the, if the possibility exists that there could be blood from the, from the female child, um, then, the mother, so then they just assume that it's going to happen. Then the mother has to serve that time for, for the baby. Yeah, that's the best explanation we've had. Yes. Well, it actually comes out to 33 and 7, 40. So it's 33, 7, and then 66, 14. So it's 80, 40. And, so there, and there's basically what you have is two separations of the time, 7 and 33, and then 14 and 66 for the... Um, and I, the way it works out, so what did they say here? It says, uh, um, let me go back here. Uh, just a second here. Yeah, see, if the woman is born a male child, then she will be unclean seven days, as in the days of her customary impurity. And on the eighth day, the flesh was to be circumcised. She shall then continue the blood of her for 33 days. She shall not touch any hallowed thing. Okay, that's verse 4. A female child, verse 5, should be unclean two weeks as her customary impurity. And she'll continue the blood of her purification. So I think what it, what it worked out is after seven days, she could, do the, she could do the purification and then go back in the temple. But she was still... So it's, they, they divide up into 40 because they view 40 as kind of like a way of thinking of life. And the number 40 was kind of like a, a lifespan. And 40 becomes a, a kind of a way of talking about the fullness of life. So like you have the first kings of Israel, they're 40, 40, 40. Uh, 40 days and 40 nights, the flood. I mean, 40s is kind of a significant number. So um, it's like she can do part of the purification process after, after seven days or 14 days. And then the other part after the, after the 33 and then after the, 40, after the 66. So it's, like it's divided up into twos. I don't, I'm not exactly sure why. Um, not exactly sure why they divide it up like that, but they do. So it's one of those mysteries that we just don't. Any other questions about that? Yeah. Yes. Once blood has been applied to the altar, it's now, it's now 
uh, Kodesh, it's holy, so it doesn't, it doesn't bring impurity. Blood only brings impurity if it's outside the altar, outside the tabernacle. So, now, huh? No, because the sac- because the the tabernacle was a picture of the heavenly tabernacle, uh, the heavenly kingdom. So it's it's a picture of that, and because of that, no no one with diminished life can come in the presence of God. Because the blood was lost outside the tabernacle. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's not. It belongs to that realm. So because it belongs to that realm, it can't come in here. So and so now, by the way, to be fair to the to be fair to the women on this, um, I have to be careful here. Um, if a man also diminishes life fluid, I'll just leave it like that. Um, he also has to wait a day and do a purification, and then he can come back after um, after one day. The, they they feel like the the fluids have come back after one day, so he has to wait one day. So. To be fair, I mean, there's waiting periods on both sides of this as far as, and again, this is all with relationship to entering the tabernacle because the tabernacle was viewed as the presence of God on earth where he sits enthroned. So you can't just waltz in there and think, well, I'm just going to come in here willy-nilly in in any way I want to. You have to consider consider your status at the time that you're getting ready to go in. It's not just like, oh, I can just waltz in there and, I'll just come in and see God because, you know, there's nothing going on today. I'll just hang out. Well, you better think about your situation and where you were at before you do that. Because if you, if you just go in there without consideration for where you are status-wise, you bring the possibility of God hitting the smite button and saying, you're unclean, you've come in here unclean, and knowingly done so, he can do that. He can hit it really quick. Okay, if he wants to, because you have brought contamination, what you've done is you've brought death into the presence of the living God. So that brings, that creates a, that creates a conundrum that should not exist. Everything must be fully alive. The irony is the only thing that can die in his presence is that which is going upon the altar. But at that point, it's become sanctified. It's become part of the tabernacle. Now it's one with it. Well, I think you're talking about uh, the book of Hebrews says, yes, and I think in prayer we can come boldly to the throne of grace. I don't think we come boldly into the tabernacle. That's a different, I think that's a different thing. I can stand outside the tabernacle and pray to God. I don't need to go into the tabernacle to pray to him. We have evidence of many people who stood outside the tabernacle and outside the temple, many of them because they were in exile and prayed. Daniel prays three times a day to God in exile, and God hears his prayer. So I can boldly go to the throne of God in prayer. I cannot boldly just walk into the tabernacle or temple without having thought about what status am I in before I go in. And that, by the way, everybody, including the priests, have to think about their status before they go in. It's not just like, oh, well, you can just waltz in here. Waltzing in there without the consideration of your status can get you messed up. Yes, we mentioned him um, about three or four weeks ago. He goes in, and the priests go in there and say, you better get out of here. And he's like, well, I'm, a, I'm the king. And they say, well, that's fine, but you know, this is not where you belong. This is not your area. He's in the holy place, not the most holy place. And they say, well, you better get out of here. He wants to offer some incense. And he says, no, they say no. And he, it says he starts, to, he starts to develop, and that, that's a great lead-in, he develops zara'at. He starts getting skin blotches that just start popping out. And they start, they rush him out of there. Okay? And he, and he ushers himself out as well at the same time. Now, let's talk about Zara'at. Now, they translate it. This is all chapter 13. And this goes into our Haftor reading and our Apostolic reading. Because 
why do you think that zara'at, and they translate it lepra, which is where we get leprosy, although modern day leprosy, which is called Hansen's, is a neurological disorder, something completely different. Today, in the Bible, we're talking about zara'at, we're talking about a spectrum of skin disorders. Why do you think that skin disorders were prohibitive of somebody going into the tabernacle? It's a physical defect. Death, exactly. Huh? It's a blemish. Now, where would you, where would you other than Leviticus 13, where would you get the notion that zara'at was like death? What text would you turn to besides Leviticus 13 that just speaks about Zerah'at? There's a, there's a text I'm thinking of that, that kind of lays this out. Well, let's do this. Who are the two people? Yes, let's go there. Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. Look at what's said about her. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. Then Miriam and Aaron, note the syntax, she, spoke and she speaks first, spoke against Moses because the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Anytime scripture does that, stop, and you get, it, there's, something, there's something poignant there. We have this at the end of chapter 11 in Genesis, where it says, and and uh, Sarah was barren, she had no children. Duh, well that means the same thing. Or at the end of chapter, I think it is 40, 39 or 40 in Genesis where it says, and the butler forgot Joseph, he did not remember him. Well, that doesn't forgot and did not remember, it's kind of the same thing. Well, okay, here we have, he had married, he had married an Ethiopian woman. Because of an Ethiopian woman, it's kind of redundant. It's a sham. That's not the issue with them. The issue is they want leadership with Moses. They want to share the leadership. Actually, they'd like to have a little bit more. Why do you think that, why do you think that Aaron and Miriam want a little bit more authority than Moses? They're older than him. In a patriarchal society, those that are older generally had more responsibilities. And they're saying, hey, you know, we're older than Moses. Why does Moses get to be the leader? Simple reason. God said so. Pretty simple. God picks and says, I want Moses to do it. And I didn't pick you for that. We have a problem with that. We'd like for God to, you know, give us reasons and spell it out. Sometimes God just says, just because I said so. Well, sure. He, that, yeah, but that's, that goes against the culture. The culture says... Not against him, but the culture. The culture says, hey, the oldest should have more authority, more responsibility. Moses and Aaron say, hey. And by the way, notice it says, the, it says Mo, Miriam and Aaron speak and spoke. Now you'd expect it to say in the text, Miriam and Aaron, they spoke against Moses. It doesn't say that. It says, Miriam and Aaron, she spoke. So the primary speaker in both the in both the syntax, the, that is the order of the words, and then in the verbal form, tell us Miriam is the, is the one who is the primary speaker. Once again, we find Aaron, in all of his glory, standing around saying nothing. He does this earlier. Golden calf, right? Hey, Aaron, build us a golden calf. All right, well, they made me do it. This is your high priest. So, look what happens. So, they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Does God only speak to Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. And the Lord heard it. You know what? It's a good thing to think about this, that nothing we say goes unheard by him. Nothing we say, nothing we think goes by him. That's a frightening thought. You know, I often tell people, you know, if, if, when I go speak at other places, I'll say things like, you know, if, if you knew everything about me, you wouldn't listen to me, but then if I knew everything about you, I wouldn't talk to you. So, you know, it's, it's just, 
I mean, we all have things that we think and things that we say that in those guarded and private times that God knows about. It's not as if it escapes him. It's not as if he doesn't know it. And he hears these two over talking. They think nobody else is listening. And they're saying, well, does God only speak to Moses? I mean, is that the only one he talks to? I mean, verse 4, suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out here to the tabernacle meeting. So they came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud. Wow. And stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. That's not good. Then he said, hear now my words. Is there a prophet among you? I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. I got dreams and visions. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him mouth to mouth. The text says mouth to mouth. I speak to him the fullness, that means this, the fullness of the revelation. And he says, I'm going to skip down now. Look what happens. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against him, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, by the way, that's got to be freaky, this cloud comes down and starts talking. Now, they don't see anything in this that we could tell. They don't see anything, but just the cloud's talking. It's this cloud chariot, by the way. We'll come back to the chariot in a moment. It says, when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam, leprous, as white as snow. Why doesn't Aaron get bit? Because God likes men. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> See, here again. It's just the woman that gets it. We got millions of texts like this. She spoke against Moses. She was the one that actually did the speaking. But here's the other thing. But, but there's a reason why God doesn't smite Aaron. I just mentioned it a while ago. He's the high priest. So... There's nobody to atone for her if he smites Aaron. All right? So there's a reason. Now, here's what happens. Look, what, look, how, look, how, look how Aaron describes what happened to her. He says, so Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly, in which we have sinned. Please not be, let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So that's how Moses, that's how Aaron describes what's happened to Miriam. Ooh. I don't know what happened, but it was, all I can say is, ooh. That's not good. Now, I love Moses' prayer. Moses' prayer is very emotional. He says this in verse 13. He says, El na rafa Nahla. It goes like this. He says, please heal, please, no, God, please heal, please her. Very halting, very emotional. And had Moses not interceded for her, God says she wouldn't have been healed. Now, Miriam is healed, although it takes a week. It takes a week for this to all play out. Okay? Now, there's only one other person. Now, Miriam is an Israelite. Miriam's an Israelite. There's only one other person in the Hebrew Scriptures that's ever healed of Zara'at, a man named Naaman. Okay? He's a Gentile. He's from Syria. He's also healed of Zara'at. Okay? So we have a Gentile and a Jew, both miraculously, miraculously healed of Zara'at, or what we now call leprosy. Now we fast forward a little bit. Remember what I said about the, about the army of God? We've talked about this army of God. Did you catch the reading in 2 Kings chapter 7? Here's what's happened. Israel is, is besieged. They have been, they've been without food. So they're rationing the food. And in the meantime, people are going without food. It sounds like, it sounds like Israel is in the process of eating horses. Okay? Things have gotten that bad. We're going to eat things that we probably shouldn't eat. Well, we shouldn't eat. According to Leviticus 11, we just talked about that. 
and the lepers are on the outside. they got to live on the outside. There's two things you know about being a leper, if you're a leper. You've got to live on the outside of the, of the city walls, and you, anybody that comes near you, you've got to say, unclean, unclean, when they approach. Well, there's a stigma for you. Imagine walking around just saying, unclean, unclean, if anybody got close. So you know that they don't touch you, because if they touch you, then they have to do all the purification. So you're on the outside. Speak of marginalized and, and pushed to the perimeters. And here's what happens. They're on the outside, and the problem is the army of, this army is on the outside as well, though. Besieging. But the army doesn't want anything to do with these lepers. Why would they? So they're like, i leave them alone. They're harmless. And these lepers think to themselves, you know what? Let's go throw ourselves on the mercy of this army, this foreign army. What can it hurt? We're, we're going without food as well. Because they probably had people from the outside throwing them food before all this siege happened. Now, they're not getting food from the inside either because the people on the inside need food. They say, well, let's go to, the, let's go to this army and throw ourselves on the mercy of the army. What's the worst that can happen? Best case scenario, they say, here's some food, now get lost. That would be good. Worst case scenario, they kill us. Well, without food, we're going to die anyway. Eh, okay. And what happens is, somehow miraculously, the army of God's angels and chariots turn up the volume, and this foreign army believes that they hear chariots and horses. And that Israel has gotten help from some foreign nation. Are you kidding? Israel's cowering in fear. So where, what is this army of chariots and horses? I submit to you that it's the chariot army of God. It's the chariot army of God. <coughs> and he just turns up the volume so they can all hear it. And they think to themselves, man, we're going to be attacked. And they're outnumber they outnumber us. Judging by, the, judging by the volume of noise, these approaching hoofbeats, it sounds like we're way outnumbered. And they just get up and leave. And now these lepers come to the encampment. They've just gotten up and left everything. They get in there, and they're thinking to themselves, wow, we hit the jackpot. This is great. Now, if you're a leper, and you know that everybody on the inside doesn't really like you. In fact, you have to call unclean when they come around. You've already been marginalized. What's your view of the people on the inside? You know what? Forget them. I'm out here. I got food. They don't know about it. And then one of the lepers says, you know, this really isn't the right thing. They're all in there starving. We got food out here. We should probably go tell them. And they go and tell them, and they don't believe them. Who believes a leper? You're on the marginal, you're on the margins of society. You're on the periphery. You're not going to believe this. There's nobody out here in these encampments. Yeah, all right. Sure. Sure. Well, send a few people out just to check it out, would you? They get out there and they realize. Well, that's right. There is nobody out there. What happened? The whole army just got up and left. And why? Because they heard the chariot army of God, and all God did was basically, I think what he did, maybe who knows, maybe he just played a record and just turned up the volume. Or maybe they were out there coming. But bottom line is, this army heard another army coming. But it certainly isn't Israel. They're inside cowering in fear. They're not, they're not allying themselves with any other nations who are coming to their help. The one that came to their help was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Adonai Sivaot, the God of armies. <laughs> Our God is a warrior. He has this warrior army that he puts to, the, puts to this situation, and all of a sudden, the, the other army flees. Now, if you have zara'at, if you have leprosy, 
like we said, you can't go into the tabernacle. Much, not, not only can you not go in the tabernacle, you can't even be inside the city gates. You're that unclean. You are, not only are you unclean, but you are, you're contagious. If anybody touches you, they're unclean. So it's not only enough that you're unclean, now you are, we have to quarantine you, so to speak, because you're contagious. Fast forward now to our Matthew text. Remember that the only way anybody was ever healed of Zara'at was through miraculous intervention. Naaman goes to the prophet. The prophet tells him, dip in the Jordan seven times. You know the whole story. won't go recapitulate that. And then Miriam, again miraculously, because she's connected with Moses and Aaron. She's connected with the leader, and she's connected with the high priest. Yeah, one time. Moses has the rod. He just puts it in, pulls it out. Bam, bam, bam. Right? So, yeah, but again, miraculous. In the sense that God tells him, just put it in there. Put your hand inside your cloak. Puts it in. Leprous. Puts it back in. Why does, I mean, everything's fine. No problem. That's a really quick. But as far as an individual who had it for any length of time, Miriam and Naaman. Now, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Go with me there. This is Yeshua encountering a man with Zara'at. This is Matthew chapter 8. And look at what happens. It says, when he, that's Yeshua, had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him. Just stop there for a second. This leper comes and worships him. Do you think that lepers had a, an affinity for Yeshua? I think they did. Why? He's on the margins as well. He's on the margins as well. They understand, they understand being outcasts. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, Nobody had ever been made clean of leprosy other than Naaman and Miriam. And he says to Yeshua, if you want to, you can make me clean. Wow. Then Yeshua, now check this out. Remember, they're the untouchables. Contagious. Then Yeshua put out his hand and touched him. I got a feeling that's probably one of the few times that this person had been had physical touch in a long time. And to show that this was still a human being, that he was still of value, Yeshua says, reach out your hand. He doesn't do this to everybody. He doesn't need to do this. In fact, Yeshua can just say the word and it's done. He doesn't need to touch anybody for them to be healed. But here's a person that probably needs to be touched. But doesn't this make Yeshua unclean? And isn't this contagious? And look what happens. Then Yeshua put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Yeshua said to him, See that you tell no one. Now why does he do that? His time hasn't come. It's not yet time. He keeps saying, my time has not yet come. I don't want people knowing who I am yet. Call the, 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 the title for this in the scholar literature is The Messianic Secret. Okay, So we, keep have, we have The Messianic Secret. Don't tell anybody. Usually when, usually when Yeshua tells people don't tell anybody, they go tell a bunch of people. It's human nature, right? If he'd have told them, go tell everybody, they'd have gone, nah. But he tells them, don't tell anybody, and they go, Generally, tell everybody. Now, look what happens. He says, but go your way. Now, look what she... she, Go your way. Show yourself to the priest. And offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. He doesn't say, ah, just, you know, it's been nice knowing you. Glad glad I could heal you. It's all been good. He says, no. Go show yourself to the priest. Why? If you read Numbers, Leviticus chapter 13, there's still a remedy. 
He wants this man to be restored, not only his body, but he also wants him restored to the tabernacle, of the temple, which is the presence of God. So he can worship with the community of faith. So he says to him, he doesn't say to ignore the Torah. He says, do what the Torah said. This is one of the reasons why we've had for so long, and I was mentioning this yesterday to another individual, one of the reasons why the Jewish people have rejected Yeshua. Is because we've said, well, he wasn't a Torah observant individual. He just did away with the Torah. He came to do away with it. He came to abolish it. He didn't come to abolish it. Why would he stand right here and say to this man, go show yourself to the priest and do what Moses commanded? If he was doing away with it, he would have just said, well, I'm starting something completely new. I'm starting something brand new. This is a whole new movement. So we can get rid of those priests and we can get rid of that Moses. It's not important. He doesn't do that. And remember what we said. Leprosy was a form, a form of little death. He's demonstrating right here, as was demonstrated with the others, that he can reverse the effects of death. That he can take the effects of death upon the skin and reverse them. Anti-aging in its most incredible form. He can take what looks to be like death and reverse it back into life. And, to put it in another terms, since death is the finality for this life, he shows that he can bring the, he can bring the eternal future into the present because of who he is. He can take the eternal future in which there will be life forever and bring it into the here and now. But did you find the, did you find the question intriguing, what the man says? He says, you can do this if you will. If you will. Do you have the will to do this? And Yeshua says, yeah, I have the will to do this. Very interesting, that, that language. Do you, do you want to do this? Yeah, I want to do this. Now, normally, Yeshua's asking that of the people he's going to heal. Here, it actually flips. Normally, Yeshua says to people, do you want to be made whole? I think the reason why Yeshua normally asks that question is this. There are some people who, having been sick and diseased or whatever for so long, they define themselves by their illness. And when the actual day of healing comes, you have to ask them, really, do you want to be well? Because this won't be your identity anymore. This will be a new identity. You've been classified, classifying yourself as whatever, illness, not going to be anymore. There's a new identity. Do you really want to be healed? Because understand, from this day forward, it's different. This individual actually flips it and says to Yeshua, you can do this if you will. Do you really want to do this? And Yeshua says, yeah, I really want to do this. He's testing the resolve of Yeshua to see if he has the will. And Yeshua says, yeah, I have the will to do this. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why. This is the mission. This is the whole mission. Yeah. Not a prophecy in the not a prophecy in the in the prophets themselves. There were there were and I need to bring the list and just lay it out for you. But there were in the rabbinic material oral tradition of the time messianic expectations of what the Messiah would do when he comes. That if he were the Messiah, he would be able to do certain things, do certain types of healings. And leprosy is one of those. That Because it was such a, a rare thing, and the only individuals that had ever been healed of it were healed in miraculous fashion. 
so Naaman because he goes to the prophet and then Miriam because she goes to Moses and Aaron so both of those direct intervention by God and so two individuals of all the individuals two At, on another occasion Yeshua heals ten of them and again they traveled in num- they usually traveled in, in groups for safety and for a lot of other reasons but I think because I do think it is a messianic I do think it's a messianic uh, ty- uh, not title, but a uh, miracle in the sense that he's showing he's able to do this type of healing, the reversal of this. Yes. Yeah, Isaiah. To speaking of Isaiah 53, right? Yeah. So there is there is Isaiah 53, which talks about him bearing our iniquities and our sins and our our diseases and healing, being able to heal. So Isaiah 53 would be one that would. So I think that, you know, to put it in the, in, the, in the bigger picture of the kingdom of God, and I want to keep coming back to this, the kingdom of God is the picture. Yeah, hold on, go ahead. I think so, because he's a worshiper. It's almost like your will be done. Do you want this to happen? And if you don't want this to happen, I'm willing to, I'm willing to live with this. Yeah, are you willing? Yeah, and how does he, you know, Lord, your will be done. Because it says he's a worshiper. So this is a man who already has faith in Yeshua. He already believes that he is the one. He doesn't come with, with doubts about, about Yeshua's ability. He comes, he comes with questions about his desire for it to happen. Which again is that submission to the will of God. So I think that's why he asked, yes. Which, is a, which tells you something about this man's faith. The one thing we see about lepers is, one thing we see about them, like with the Second Kings chapter 7 text, um, the, uh, um, this text here, the 10, I mean, you start to see that lepers, because they're so outcast, uh, they small groups, and they seem to have had some devout faith. You know, because they, they, they probably had a lot of time together to discuss, you know, everything, everything and, and that, that small camaraderie. They seem to have had a lot, of, a lot of faith. They come to Yeshua asking, hey, can you heal us? Now, they don't come back for thank. One comes back to thanks him, thank him. And he says, didn't I heal ten? Where are the nine? Okay. So, maybe they got already excited about just being healed. Um, yeah, yes. Oh, definitely. Yes. Right. Yeah, there's a strong connection, very strong connection between spiritual issues and physical issues. There is an incredibly strong connection between the two. So, um, you know, I think we do injustice to think that all, all, all physical stuff can just be dealt with by doctors. You know, there's a lot of things that have, the reason why the physical is falling apart is because the spiritual has fallen apart. Not in every sense, not in every instance, but in many cases. So, in many cases, the reason we have physical issues and physical problems is because there are spiritual issues as well. I love the, in the opening of his book, Words That Wound, Words That Heal, by Joseph Telushkin. He tells a story in there of this man who comes to this rabbi, and he says to the rabbi, I want to apologize, rabbi, for all these things I've been saying about you this negative stuff, and this Lashon Harab, and say, 
And the rabbi says, I forgive you, but I got one thing I'd like for you to do. I want you to go and take a feather pillow and scatter all the feathers to the wind. And then come back and see me. So he says, okay. So he goes, takes his feather pillow, scatters all the feathers to the wind. He comes back to the rabbi, and the rabbi says, I only have one more thing I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you to go gather up all the feathers. And he says, well, that's impossible. And he says, well, now you understand why it's impossible for you to retract everything you've said. Once it's out there, it's out there. Once it's been spoken, you can't really take it back. It's out there. So, that's just... Yeah, and the rabbis make the point that the reason why Zara'at, leprosy, comes is because they make the point because of, of Numbers chapter 12 that it comes because of Lashon Hara, evil speech. I don't think that's the only reason because I think Naaman has it and others have it as well, but um, it certainly could be one reason. But, um, but I think that there's this connection between the physical and the spiritual, and here's the, you see this connection with this man when he says, do you have the will, this is a spiritual issue, do you have the will to heal me? And Yeshua says, yes, it's in my will. Wow. I'm willing to live with this, I'm a worshiper. I'm willing to live with this if this is your will. If it's not your will, then heal me. If it is your will, we think that it's always the will of God to bring healing. Would you be surprised to find out that there's times where it's not the will of God to bring healing? That in this world, it will not be better. That it just won't get better even if you ask. The Apostle Paul prays three times. I mean, here's a man who's a super apostle. If there's a guy that should have ever gotten his prayer answered, I think maybe this is one of them. Here's another one. Moses. Moses commits a sin. He stands in front of the people and he says, shall we bring water out of this rock for you? That's a spiritual sin. He equated himself with God. God was not going... God was not in Moses' pocket. It wasn't about... It wasn't, it wasn't the we. God's saying, God's saying, who's the we, Moses? There is no we. I bring water from the rock. You stood in front of these people and said, shall we? Well, I want to know who the we is. And because of that, you're not going to go in the promised land. Moses comes back to God at the very end of his life and says, hey, God, if you, really, if you reconsider this, I'd really like to go in. And God says, no. The answer is still No. You can look over and see it, but you're not going in. You didn't show me holy in front of these people. Wow. Harsh judgment. From us, it seems that way. But God says, you know what? No, that's the way it is. Paul prays three times. Take this thorn in the flesh from me. God says, no, my grace will be sufficient. I'm working something better in you. So sometimes the answer is, sometimes the answer to healing is, yes, I will heal you. I will heal you later. Or, no, I won't heal you at all. Yes, no, and later. We like the yes. We're even okay with the later. We're very uncomfortable with the no. That really bothers us. But what if, he says, and the question becomes then this, will you still be a worshiper of him if the answer is no, are you, so submit, are you so committed to his will that the question becomes, Lord, is the, and what does Yeshua pray? How does Yeshua pray? Lord, if this is your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Even he comes to that point where he says, if there's another plan up there that I haven't heard about, if there's another way around this, knowing he's about to suffer, he says, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Submitted to the will of God. That's what he asks of all of us. And this is the way we should approach, I think, should approach God all the time, which is, Lord, here's my petition. Here's what I ask for. Nevertheless, I want what you want. Ultimately, I want what you want. 
I know what I want. I want yes. I'll even be okay with later. But I'm even okay, Lord, with no. If that's what you want. That's a tough place to get to. But I think he wants all of us to get to that place where at least we're willing to accept the no. Knowing that in his, that in that no is the presence of God with us, the grace of God with us. He says to Paul, my grace will be sufficient. And I'll draw you close to me in that whole process. And I think this is why we have lepers. They draw close to God because they're on the, they're on the edge. They're on the periphery. They understand marginalization. They understand what it's like to suffer. Anyway, yeah. I, I think it's, I think it's in Psalm. This is the Psalm. Sounds like the Psalms. The Psalm. Psalm 19, 119. Okay, so we'll meet 119. Okay. Okay, I'd have to look it up, but yeah, that's. Sure. Yeah. And I'm not saying, please hear me, I'm saying two things. The, the physical is connected to the spiritual. They're both connected. We are not this dichotomy where we just have a body that's over here doing its own thing and a spirit doing its own thing, separate. They are interconnected. So... And I'm also saying, look, there's nothing wrong with, I'm not going to the extreme saying, well, one should never seek for medical help. No, I, I think there's nothing wrong with seeking for medical help and using, you know, using medical remedies. God has given us these. These come from the gracious hand of God as well. So I'm not going to that, I'm not going that realm. But what I am saying is there's sometimes that God says no for whatever reason. And in, those, in that no is the grace of God and the strength of God to bring us through to where he wants us to be. Well, I think he's, I think he's, I think it's a very Hebraic way of saying, look, what you do demonstrates what you believe. And if you go to this, if you go and do the obedience, it will demonstrate where your heart is and where your, that you have obedience to the word of God. I'm telling you to go do exactly what the word of God commanded. Because when, when word gets out, they're going to know you're a leper. And when it, get, word gets out that the leper's been healed, they're going to go, wow, that hasn't happened in a long, 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 long time. In fact, what's going to happen is, I think the Levites are probably going to have to go back to Leviticus 13 and go, what do we do with lepers? Nobody studied leprosy in a long time. So they're going to have to go, well, get out the books and let's find out what we do with lepers. Oh yeah, we're supposed to do this and they're supposed to bring this sacrifice. And, okay, and we're supposed to look over their skin. Okay. See, by the way, in the Bible, and by the way, it's not this way, it's not just this way in the Bible, it's this way in a lot of other cultures. Your, your spiritual leaders were your medicine men. Because they understood that medicine and spirituality were tied together. It's only in Greek Western thinking that we say, well, we have the medical profession, and then we have the spiritual leaders. These are two separate entities. Uh -uh. In every other culture, your medicine man and your religious man were the same. Because they understood that spirit and body worked together. They understood that intrinsically. It's only in our culture where we say, well, we have this profession over here that does its own thing with the body, and this one over here that does its own thing with the spirit. These are two separate things. But anybody that's, anybody that's been around the ministry long enough knows that if a person, for instance, has anger, unforgiveness, I can list a bunch of things that will start to have physical, start to manifest themselves in physical problems. If, they're, if they go unchecked. Show me a person who has unforgiveness and they'll have physical problems that will manifest. Show me a person who has anger and they'll have physical problems that'll just perpetuate. That's just one, that's just two instances. We could go on and on. 
It's connected. And the biblical text understood that connection. That if there's not healing of the, if there's not healing of the spirit, there won't be healing of the body ultimately. It understood this intrinsically. 